the response I got to the video I did on the fantasy trip, melee wizard in the labyrinth, that whole system, really surprised me because people wanted more. They wanted to see a little bit more of how a campaign was created, how I use different aspects of material that's available to create a solo RPG. So I decided to do a, a small series of videos on that following up on what the foundations that were laid in that video. Um, I put the video link below here so you can go back and watch that. There's a couple that are related. That one goes over some of the basic system. And what's back in this video, here's part of my party. Um, you've seen this before, perhaps. What's back is the three ring binder with the fantasy trip in it. And what we're going to be doing here in this video and the ones that follow is show you a little bit more of a walkthrough of how I use existing systems, both old and new, to help create a solo campaign experience for myself, a solo adventure, a solo dungeon crawl in this case, and how I also work in a pre-programmed adventure to help me along the way. In the other video, I was talking about Treasure of the Silver Dragon. Here we're going to be talking about a different one, and I'll show you that in a bit. But I use the uh, paragraph structure of the existing scenario as a starting point, as the architecture for the story that I'm doing and then there are there's a side story that's completely created from my own head using various tools that allow you to basically be a GM against yourself and this series of videos will walk you through how I do it it's possible to do it without spending a ton of money it's possible to do it without reading or needing to know thousands of pages of rules and descriptions and spells and etc and um, it's, it's really fun, it's immersive, and the story is created on the fly, and I'll be sure to show you how that happens and also get into a little bit more demonstration of how I use the minis, how combat happens, and how some other things happen, actually, rather than just discussing uh, the possibilities for that. I'm going to go over the party a little bit more in detail later on, but because I'm talking about the kind of meta story here. I want to just explain to you what my party is. I'm picking up um, something that I used in the other campaign but didn't really demonstrate, which is we are traveling with um, an old wizard who is quite wise but not very strong. And that is represented by this fellow here. He's going to be my mini for the old wizard. He has a um, an acolyte, a, a student, a... Uh, companion who is a young wizard who is not that wise but is rather dexterous and not that strong and while typically turtles are not that dexterous I don't think nevertheless well I suppose with their shell they could be that's the turtle so these are my two wizards for this particular outing we are also going with a scholar and that is Mr. Peabody he's the scholar and he's a naturalist an expert naturalist in fact he can detect traps and he can assess value and he's the strategist he's basically on some level the party leader and he is going to be in conflict with the priest that we're also traveling with and I don't have my priest mini ready Ready yet. I'm not sure what it's going to be. Who is the, as you can see here, I noted down, there's going to be some conflict between the two of them because the priest also has some attributes such as um, diplomacy. Well, I've got this crossed out here. It's a little bit of a mess. I need to tighten it up. But he has movement and he has alchemy and disguise and so he is going to be in to conflict to some extent with the scholar as the two non-military non-magic leaders in the group and we're going to see how that plays out in the meta adventure that I am going to be using on top of the system that exists. And then we have our two fighters. And the two fighters here, I'm 
at the moment going with these minis from another game, which some of you may recognize. I'll put it up in a second. I'll give you a chance to recognize it. So I've got the two uh, fighter minis, and they are basically, this one has the crossbow, so he is a ranged fighter, and that's why I chose this mini here to indicate that. And this is more of a hand-to-hand -hand guy. He's got a battle axe, um, and so these are my two fighters. So in this particular case, we have a, a party of six, the two wizards, the two fighters, and the scholar and the priest with the story that the old wizard needs to be accompanied. Everyone is here to accompany this old wizard somewhere to basically save him. And it's pretty vague intentionally as to what they're doing and why. And I'll show you how I demonstrate or how I uh, devise uh, more specificity there. And in conflict, we have Mr. Peabody, the scholar, and the priest, who's uh, mini, as I said, is not here. That is also a subplot. So that is the party. To help flesh out my story, I'm turning to the Classic Dungeon Design Guide by Kent David Kelly. This is available as an ebook and I think probably a PDF. I have a physical copy here from Wonderland Imprints. And what this is are a bunch of tables um, or lists you could call them with that are key to roles that you do on a decimal die to make your selections and they're organized by uh, theme or topic. So here's something about the dungeon surroundings and um, he has a whole thing here about actually the history of the dungeon that you might be in. There are some map symbols here. There's examples here of say if you want to create intermittent sounds in your dungeon. Now of course I don't use a lot of this, and what I like about this resource, aside from its simplicity of use, is that the beginning sections, and what that's mostly what I'm going to focus on here, are relatively broad. They talk about um, foundational, overarching narrative ideas, and I like the challenge of just randomly choosing one and seeing how I can then fit it into the story I already have in my own mind. If you wanted to use this to create an actual, you know, a literal dungeon or a dungeon, say, that was like in an old manor house or whatever, you could do that and find very specific information there about the monsters that are there, the, say, uh, physical features in a room, etc. And the end part of the book actually walks you through how that can be done. It, it's a really great resource. I like it quite a bit. So what we're going to do is I'll just show you how I use it for the beginning and then um, how I fit it into the story that I have. My two D10s, um, I always pick colors that are at opposite ends of the alphabet because if I get confused and forget, as I often do, I remember that um, it's alphabetical. So this is going to be represent the ones and this is going to represent the tens as blue and yellow. And we're going to be using these on our rolls. The first thing I'm selecting from this book um, is what he calls the starting scenarios. And that is on page, oh no, excuse me, the adventure scenarios. Um, he calls them the plot hook. So this is the reason for the story. Now I've already told you that I have my reason for the story. So we're going to see how I can somehow take something from here and fit it in with, um, with the story that I have to just make it a little more three-dimensional and also something that um, provides the feeling, I guess, of a GM in the sense that a random thing you're given um, and then I have to deal with it. So first I'm going to roll on this adventure scenario. So I'm going to roll my two d10s and see what did I get here. I got a 45. So let's check it out and see what... 45 is here. Okay. Inciting a war. Is this, let's see. Yep. Inciting a war. Two immense swarms of monsters. Examples populated a nearby dungeon and are preparing to eradicate nearby human cities. The outmatched adventurers are called upon to decimate the fiend's numbers. They must start a war between the two hordes, perhaps by slaughtering a few guardians on each side and then planting evidence. Well, that's very complicated, etc. Once the violence begins, the adventurers will all too happily make the situation even more chaotic by adding to the slaughter as best they can. Okay, 45 to 46. So, not sure how I'm going to fit that one in because um, it doesn't necessarily fit with what I'm trying to do here, but I'll note it down. I rolled a 45. I'll come back to it. I'll show you how I um, figure that part out. Then the next section I'm going to turn to is what is called... Um, 
let's see, what is he called? A scenario twist. So this is an unexpected complication which makes the adventure more interesting. And let's see what we roll for that. <laughs> 42. I didn't do very good rolling there, but um, let's make sure I'm in the right spot. 42. Oh, here we go. Forbidden Stronghold. The monsters gain the upper hand. The monster population proves to be far too overwhelming for a direct assault. A different approach, stealth, hit and run, disguise, infiltration will be required. Okay. That's useful, and I can already see in my mind. Let's just write down Forbidden Stronghold. Um, I mentioned that in my party, the priest was going to be good with disguise. That's some of his attributes. Let me just pull that in here and remind you. He's got this, um, he's got disguise, he's got silent movement tracking. Something around this I'm going to bring in as um, an event perhaps or a situation where uh, the priest wants to lead them in one way perhaps and there's some conflict here. So I can, I can pick that up into the story that I already have in some way and we'll see, we'll see how that works out. The next thing I'm going to pick up from the book here, I'm skipping a little bit uh, because I'm not interested in some of the things that are in here like a um, benefactor, you know, the person sort of behind the whole thing. Um, I'm not interested in that, but I am interested in this unusual base of operation for some flavor. We will see what I get and how I can work it in, uh, where either where they're starting or where they go off, because again, I'm running this off of the existing adventure. So let's just see what we get and um, we'll see what we do with it. So I'm going to roll our dice again for Mr. Peabody. He should really be the wizard because he's quite old. All right. 39. 39. A recovered ruin of toppled marble pillars now filled over with shanty towns. Okay. So we've got a recovered ruin. And just a few more things I want to do here. I want to turn to the wilderness. Uh, let's see. Hang on. Yeah, we're skipping the rumors. Not going to deal with that. This is the way to the dungeon. Some nice things here, but it's getting too much for me at this point. I want to get them there, but I do want to do these wilderness encounters. Now, the wilderness encounters, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to roll about six times, um, and I'm going to create as such six encounters or events that occur and um, in order and this will provide a little bit of structure for me in modeling the story about how they get to where they're going and so I'm just going to do six rolls in a row note the numbers down and um, then we'll read and see what what I got so I'm going to do this on the camera just so you can see that I'm actually doing it but this is probably pretty boring okay I got a 64 I got a 72 I got 33. So that's that's three. That represents, in essence, like one act, say, if you're thinking of it in those terms. I could do three acts, but that's that's getting to be a lot. 88. Seventeen. You see that? Uh fifty-two. All right, so let's see what we get here. 64. A veiled nymph rises out of the snows, laughing musically and daring the adventurers to chase her. Well, that's enticing. Okay, 72. The adventurers find a surprising overlook above a vast expanse of terrain, a cliff, lost valley, collapsed cavern, etc. 33. 
One of the adventurers chances to look back over his shoulder and sees a translucent tower in the distance, which was certainly not there an hour ago. Well, that's good, and it actually conveniently comes at the end of, say, the first act, such as it is, so that's going to be good. 88. A sparse shower is followed by a beautiful rainbow. Leprechauns, sprites, pixies, or other fairies may be near. 17. A ravaged caravan approaches rapidly, pursued by warhorse-mounted brigands. That's good. It's going to bring some other people around. Let's see how 52 works out. 52. A pile of something significant indicates recent industry. Logs, ore trailings, dirt, sand, etc. The area appears to have been abandoned with some urgency. All right. Um, I can see a story forming in my mind already, a little story that's going to take us to where we want to go. I'm going to come away and sort of fix this up, write it down, make some notes, and come back. I've thought about it, and this is what I've come up with. What I did was I just basically rewrote me in longer notes what the prose was from it and gave it some thought in terms of how this is going to work out. The first thing I rolled was this nymph. Now, I looked up, I'm using, as mentioned in my other video, I am going to be using some of the material from In the Labyrinth. And if you look back at the video I did on Wizard and Melee, you can see more specifically what I'm talking to here. But in essence, what I have done with the flora and fauna that are provided in the In the Labyrinth material, I have given them numbers, so there is a, um, a D or you know 100 roll you can do if you're picking them up randomly. But I also looked through them to see is there something that is going to approximate this nymph that we are instructed we came up with, and I did find something. Well, there's a water elemental, but um, so I was going to go with that, but I found instead. Let's see. Well, obviously, I should have marked where I found this. There are scorpions and spiders and beetles and blood trees. There's a lot of, a lot of material here. There's various slime that you can encounter. But what closest, closest approximation that I found, there's this water elemental. And this, let's see if I can bring this in and show you here. This is what I am going to choose as representing that particular encounter. The water elemental, or undine, is found only in wet places. It may appear in water, steam, or ice. It can change from one form to another, but requires five minutes to do so and cannot fight during that time. In its watery form, it appears as a creature, often a beautiful maiden, sculpted of pure water. In this form, it will only attack individuals in the water. It does this by flowing over them and or pulling them down. An individual attacked by the Undine may drown in a foot of water. Each turn the Undine attacks you, you must make a saving roll as though you had just fallen into deep water. It explains what that would be. Uh, it explains what happens if it takes uh, in the form of steam or of ice. Now, I'm not going to be traveling anywhere that it would be ice, I don't think, unless something unexpected happens. And um, it also talks about a magic rainstorm. What's interesting about this magic rainstorm is, and then of course it gives its stats down here. What's interesting about the mention of the magic rainstorm is you may remember that one of the things I rolled on later on in the um, encounters was this mention of a rainbow and leprechaun sprites, pixies, and fairies that come out. Now, this was basically the fourth roll I did, but you can see where, you know, possibly there's some connection here. I don't know what. The, the undine or undine is coming first before the rainbow, so I'm not sure how that would work in, but it's interesting to me that there's that connection. And this is the kind of thing that 
uh, the reason why I bring in some of these structured components when I'm trying to create an adventure for myself because as I said earlier that approximates something that you might be dealing with with a GM it's forming in my mind maybe there's some connection there but quite clearly I have found something that will match up or approximate this first encounter after that they're going to an overlook and that's when they see this transparent tower in the distance which may or may not be there Remember, my meta story involves getting this old wizard somewhere. So I'm thinking probably to this magic tower. It's translucent. I think it was described as translucent. You know, maybe it's something created by this water elemental. Maybe it's something that is connected to this magic rainbow. Maybe there's a theme here of um, some illusion happening with or without water. This is the kind of thing that I will develop as I go in the adventure as I create that portion of the adventure. And the second half here of our encounters, this is involving we roll to get some rage caravan of people, so they are being pursued by brigands, so the question is are we going to help them, are they friendly, are they foe, and um, they are um, well, this is my note to myself, well, we're going to help them, are they going to take over us? And then toward the end, we rolled on these two um, concepts, concepts of seeing a pile of something that indicates there was recent um, industry or building there, and finally an abandoned area, or an area that was abandoned with urgency. So I showed you the random rolls that came out of this book, but even with the complete randomness, I'm able to create, tie in some kind of story. The themes in this story, there's going to be something with, you know, magic and water and this illusory tower. Maybe our wizard um, is someone that um, needs to get back there to help them. I don't know. Maybe they're, the caravan people are tied in to them. This is something that's going to emerge from the story as I play it out. Now remember too, this is all a side story. It's something I'm adding on to the programmed adventure that I'm going to be following. So up till now, we're just talking in very general kind of meta terms for the story. I did use this resource, the Classic Dungeon Design Guide, for a little bit more. And I'm not going to show you all that, the dice rolling, but I used it to get some attributes of a uh, the more specific locale that some of this activity is going to take in, you know, the dungeon as it were. It doesn't necessarily have to be a dungeon underground. It has to be a confined space, or it is a confined space. And there are um, attributes, as I mentioned, the book gets more specific as you go. So I did some dice rolling off camera and um, I came up with this list of things that is going to be a bit of a guide for me that um, there it's relatively it's near dark in there there's some sunlight shafts that come through there are some floating spores a slight breeze there's algae so we're getting a uh, we're getting a theme a natural theme in some manner there's some bubbling that's heard again tying into this concept of something with water is going to be going on here, clearly. In terms of the actual room I rolled, I got a royal chamber with an elaborate vault, and then I got a few things that I'm not sure how will, I would work in, or maybe I would just ignore. A, inside this chamber, there's a sack of textiles. There's an empty wasp nest. That doesn't seem to fit into my theme. Snails? Well, that could. A suggestion of a trail of, they said, coins or something else. There's a trail of something. There's a one-way concealed door. And then there's a lava tube. Well, the lava tube, lava tube, I think I'm going to just discard. That's not fitting. But this is a suggestion. It doesn't really, in the way I'm playing the game, it doesn't have any activity per se. It, or it could, interaction with things that are there. This is more like we'll just have to see. So when I get somewhere, we'll just have to see if any of these things play in. Well, where am I getting? So here we're tying back to something I touched on in a different video. Uh, the use of Gary Gygax, Gygax's 1975 article in first published in the Strategic Review and in slightly different form picked up in earlier 
early rules editions of D&D, the um, solo dungeon adventures. And I'm not going to go over this in detail because I did that in another video, but this is an article talking about creating your own dungeon with very specific charts that you can roll on to determine how you're walking and um, what passages there might be, what turns there might be, what might be inside. And I'm going to use this or selections from this, for example, uh, chamber or room contents. Well, when I finally get to my room, I'm going to roll on this table just to see what's there. And I will pick up, if there's a trick or a trap, I'll pick up the tables, I'll pick up the treasures from here. Why not? Uh, the reason that I'm doing this is because I can. It's it's, um, it's fun to me to pick up something from 40 years ago and use it in conjunction with something that I just got that was just written in the past few years and that was updated very recently. I like the fact that these two things can work together and of course putting them all next to another old system and this is going to be the foundation of what I'm running. This is the Treasure of Unicorn Gold. This is the programmed adventure that was from 1981. It is the follow-up to the Search for the Silver Dragon, which I discussed in my earlier video on Wizard and Melee. And it is described as a programmed fantasy adventure suitable for solitaire play. It's described as a sequel to Treasure of the Silver Dragon, which was MicroQuest number four of the fantasy trip role-playing game system. It says information in this, in the fantasy trip, and in the labyrinth can be used here as well as the rules for wizard and melee. And I'm doing all of that, again, adding on some material that I am bringing to it. The general course of play, it says it's an imaginary adventure by a group of heroes and or wizards. They undergo adventures, of course. They make their own decisions. They're instructed you to create characters. And um, they're saying do a 32 attribute, attribute character. I am running, I think, 36 attribute characters because I didn't, when I was doing the other video, I did not keep track of the gaining of experience points because I didn't think I was going to be doing this video. So I uh, just added on a few points, probably would have had more, but um, I'm creating slightly bigger characters to represent some experience that they have gained. And in this video, I'm really going to just start to play this. As of this filming of this second, I have not yet started to play this. My plan is to play through a little bit to get to an encounter or something and actually show you how the, um, the combat works and how the encounters work. Here's the creature table of creatures you may encounter because I didn't do that in detail in the other video and some people wanted that. And then I'll come back at a certain point and turn to um, some situation that has arisen with the setup of my side adventure because I'm putting the two of these things together. And my concept here is I am using the structure of this pre-programmed adventure and here spoiler spoiler if you don't want to see anything like this but the paragraphs that they show you that you may encounter so for example if I got to 391 I would be offered a magic sword, short sword etc so I'm using this as the GM to give me part of the story but at the same time I'm also using my own story that I've created using this, using a little bit of the Gygax solo dungeon creation um, article, and using some of the questions and percentiles from the Mythic Emulator, and my imagination, and the structure of the story that I have, something with this water elemental, to put together the adventure that I'm going on. 